Support for this podcast and the following message comes from Thomson Reuters Westlaw Edge. Nexa, formerly known as Answer One, is a leading virtual receptionist and answering service provider for law firms. Learn more by giving them a call at 800 267 9371 or online at nexa.com. Welcome to the AVA Journal Legal Rebels podcast, where we talk to men and women who are remaking the legal profession changing the way the law is practiced, and setting standards that will guide us into the future. Welcome to the Legal Rebels podcast by the ABA Journal. I'm Stephanie Francis Ward, and today I'm speaking with Rodney Smola. When he was in our inaugural class of Legal Rebels in 2009, he was the dean of Washington and Lee University School of Law and had a plan to eliminate traditional third-year work, replacing it with simulated law practice to teach students things like how to deal with clients, judges, and opposing counsel. He left Washington and Lee the same year he was a Legal Rebel and now is the dean at Widener University Delaware School of Law. Dean Smola, welcome to the show. Thank you, Stephanie. Good to be with you. Great. So you left Washington and Lee in 2009, which was the same year that we wrote about you, to go to Furman University as their president. Can you tell me, for the plan you had for 3Ls, was there some of it you got to carry out before you left? What happened with your plan? Well, you know, once the ABA labeled me a rebel, it was all over at Washington and Lee. I had no choice but to leave. <laughs> So <laughs> what, um, what happened? What happened was that the idea of revamping the third year program was something that uh, my colleagues at the Washington and Lee faculty and the alumni and student body and Virginia community began talking about from the very beginning of my becoming the dean there. And so we worked it all out and came up with the plan and created the new third year idea. Uh, in the third year of my deanship, and people were very excited about it, and we implemented it. And then it was right about that time that uh, I ended up taking another job as the university president. But Washington and Lee continued with that, and it's still a very important part of the identity of that law school. Okay. And uh, you mentioned that aspect of being a rebel. Sometimes in law school academia, there are rebels, but they might be a little resistant to change. And I was going to ask you, how was it working out that plan with faculty and your board, perhaps? Because Right. You have to remember that when Washington only made this decision, Legal education had been more or less unchanged for almost 100 years, even though we began to see most law schools open up legal clinics in the 1970s and 1980s. Still, the curriculum was overwhelmingly similar to what it had been at the turn of the century uh, at Harvard. And the law school that most American lawyers went to was more or less the same no matter where you went to school. And so it was right around when Washington and Lee made this change that there was this new surge of ferment uh, to try to get law schools to put more emphasis on professionalism and developing the judgment of students and experiential learning. The Carnegie Commission came out with a very influential report right around that time, and that added some momentum. So that was the backdrop, and it was against that backdrop that we began to have our discussions. And although there were people on both sides of the issue on the faculty at Washington and Lee, there were many, many leaders on that faculty who agreed that the time had come to try something bold, to try something new. And there ended up being broad consensus on the faculty. Well, and I'm trying to think back to 2009. My memory is that there were some complaints from GCs about associate billing being too high, but people were still going to law school in big numbers and people were still finding jobs for the most part when they got out of law school. So am I right with my memory of that time? 
Correct. The, the recession that really rattled American law schools came a couple of years after the general economic recession. And so it really began to hit law schools in 2010. So in 2009, things were still looking rosy, although there were obviously warning signals. I think that the impetus to put more emphasis on experiential learning was really not so much economically driven as it was driven by a sense of frustration that the three years of law school were not being deployed in the most constructive way. Most people felt very good about the first year of law school, that immersion that we all have in basic courses, the Socratic method, understanding how to think like a lawyer and analyze things. And people felt reasonably comfortable with the additions that took place in the second year. But I think the the ferment was, but after that, it kind of gets old and students are just taking specialty courses. It's often quite random what they're taking. And what law schools were not doing is helping students gain the competencies they need to be successful lawyers. And this was something coming from all different quarters of the profession, in my view. It was a complaint you heard from the bench. It was a complaint you heard from big law firms. It was a complaint you heard from small firms. And I had been active in practice the entire time I'd been a legal academic. And I was struck by the dissonance between my life as a real lawyer, if you will, and what went on in law school. And I felt the students were being cheated of some early exposure to what real practice was like. And the Washington and Lee faculty bought into that. And now I'm here, the dean of the Delaware Law School, and this law school faculty has embraced that wholeheartedly as well. Well, and I'm curious, I I feel like in 2009, 2010, some academics in law and administration saw that, you know, this is not, this is not going to carry on forever. Something's going to happen. We need to change, but that change is probably going to be slow coming. Did that, did you think something was going to happen we needed to change? And if so, is that one of the reasons why you left the law school world for a bit? My leaving was the, the law school didn't have a football team and, and the Fer- and Furman University did. <laughs> I mean, I just enjoyed, <laughs> I enjoyed the opportunity to be a university president and to work on that palette. And that was very fulfilling. But, but my leaving had zero to do with Washington and Lee's decision. In fact, the decision of Washington and Lee to go down the the route that I was so proud of was one of the things that made it hard to leave because uh, I, I was there at the beginning of the implementation of the new program, but I didn't I, I wasn't there to to see it carried through. But they've carried on without me. But but I would like to take up your, your question because I think when this wave of interest in more experiential learning really began to gain momentum in that 2009-2010 period. There was a lot of debate at ABA meetings. There was a lot of debate at Association of American Law School meetings. There were conferences all over the country on whether it was a good idea or a bad idea. And my sense is that within the world of law professors, people were very evenly divided. And there were people absolutely against it and people that thought it was, you know, something that was long overdue. Uh, the, I think the intensity of that debate is more or less gone. I think that the idea that there should be more emphasis on experiential learning has pretty much been accepted by just about everybody. I, I was thinking that. Yeah, that'd be a little weird if someone didn't said, no, that's bad. We shouldn't do it. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. Law school professors, like professors generally, are conservative, not in the political sense, but in the sense that we've always done things a certain way and it's difficult to retool and think differently. Things are going well for law professors. Yeah, for the most part. Yeah, I, had a, yeah. I had a friend who said being a law professor is a loophole in life. You know, it's a, it's a very <laughs> fulfilling job and, 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 and so on. But, but I think people on the merits really decided, yes, we can certainly make some adjustments. No one was saying to entirely throw out the traditional curriculum. It was just a matter of, of degree. Should it be changed by one third? Should it be changed by one sixth? You know, but everybody, I think, more or less embraced the idea that, that some things had to give. And then it just became a school by school judgment as to what would fit within the culture of a particular school, what a particular school could afford, 
you know, I never thought that one size fit all. And there were lots of ways that you could in, improve the experiences of law students. And I think what we've seen is that within the resources that schools have and their, and their own particular environments and their own particular um, culture, many law schools across the country have moved in that direction. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors, and we'll be right back. If you're missing calls, appointments, and potential clients, it's time to work with Nexa Professional. More than just an answering service, Nexa's virtual receptionists are available 24-7 to schedule appointments, qualify leads, respond to emails, integrate with your firm software, and much more. Nexa ensures your clients have the experience they deserve. Give them a call at 800-267-9371. Or visit them at nexa.com forward slash podcast for a special offer. The Insights from the Edge podcast series brings you the latest legal trends as insight attorneys sit down with industry experts. Stay informed on the latest topics, including our latest episode on five ways to identify the best AI. Check out this episode on The Legal Current from Thomson Reuters to learn how to evaluate AI solutions to ensure you have the best tools for your legal research. Hi, I'm Stephanie Francis Ward, and on today's ABA Journal Legal Rebels podcast, I am speaking with Rodney Smola, a 2009 Legal Rebel. He was recognized for his work at Washington Lee University School of Law. So you left Furman in uh, 2013, right? I did. And went back to the law school world. And what prompted you to come back to law school? Once I had finished my term there, I, I just knew that um, I loved everything about being a law school dean and being on law school faculties. And so I interviewed for deanships. And Delaware, it turns out, had a long tradition of emphasizing experiential learning. And the state of Delaware, the Delaware State Bar, is the only state in the United States that has a relatively rigorous experiential requirement in order to be admitted to the bar. So after you graduate from law school and take the Delaware Bar exam and pass it, you have to fulfill what's called the clerkship requirement, which is five months of actual law practice that involves at least 20 hours a week and the going through a whole long punch list of activities that expose you to all sorts of different practice environments, hearings and court sessions and various forms of negotiations and settlements and so on. So you really get exposed to what practice is like. Delaware is a small state with a small number of people that enter the bar every year, so it can do something like that. But it was very attractive to me to come and be the dean of a law school. This is the only law school in the state of Delaware in which the bar itself also embraces this idea. When you were at Furman, what did you miss the most about the law school world? In a way, I I remained very much involved. I, I was involved in the South Carolina bar a lot. I still engaged in some uh, work on legal cases. I taught some classes to undergraduates that were law-related. But I guess, you know, I grew up as a lawyer. I grew up as a law professor. That's been the soul of my identity for a long time. And uh, it's, it was kind of good to finally come back home. I see. And speaking of coming back home, I was looking at your bio and it looks to me like you have worked as a professor or a dean. Is it about five different states? Am I right? I don't know how many states, but I think it's 10 law schools. So I started in Chicago at DePaul. Uh, Erwin Chemerinsky, who's the dean of the Berkeley Law School now, and I started in offices side by side at Uh DePaul. Then I went to University of Illinois. And then it's just been It's just been a journey. I've spent about half my time at state university law schools, half my time at private law schools, sometimes in big cities, sometimes in uh, college towns. I didn't plan it that way. It just worked out that way. Uh, But I have managed to remain a Chicago Bears fan my entire life. And as I give you this interview, I'm still crushed by our defeat. Right. Uh, 
I don't want to say I'm not a Bears fan, but I really don't know anything about football. So for our listeners, why don't you just say briefly what happened on, it was Sunday, right? So I'm a, I'm a Chicago and I grew up in Chicago and have been, been devoted to every, every Chicago sports team uh, in existence and live and die with them. And uh, as, as this interview is being conducted, the Bears lost a heartbreaking last second playoff game to the Philadelphia Eagles. Where, yes, where, and everybody, right. everybody where I currently live is an Eagles fan because Wilmington, oh, Delaware sure. is right yeah. on the edge of Philadelphia. And so I have been um, proudly walking around town with my Bears uniform and listening to scenes <laughs> everywhere I've been in the last <laughs> two days, but such is life. Well, so do you have advice, because you have done a lot for your career over the years, and a lot of that's been moving around and going to different schools. What advice would you have, say, for someone who is just entering the dean track, who's maybe in their 40s or 30s, what's the one piece of advice you would have for them about building their career? Well, you know, I I never thought of this as building my career. Everywhere I went, I always thought that's where I would always be for the rest of my career. And just accidents of life happen and things change. You know, and we've seen that happen in the profession generally. When I was a young lawyer, uh, I started off at uh, Mayor Brown in Chicago, and I thought that's where I'd be for 40 years. And, you know, there were lawyers in that epoch who went to work for a law firm somewhere in the United States, and that's where they stayed forever. And, of course, now we know lawyers are very, very mobile, and they move mm-hmm. around, and people change jobs a lot. I think, the you know, the advice that I have for my friends who are, who are becoming deans uh, is that it's a marathon, not a sprint. And they, they need to be patient and they need to build relationships and uh, they need to be resilient. And uh, it's a wonderful, fulfilling job because you go to work every day trying to figure out how you can help students and help colleagues and help the profession. And I've, I've been delighted that I've had that chance at several different places. Dean, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for interviewing me. And listeners, I also want to thank you for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, please find us and rate us in Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, Google Podcasts, and or your favorite podcasting app. We'll see you next time for another episode of the ABA Journal Legal Rebels Podcast. If you'd like more information about today's show, please visit LegalRebels.com or LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS. Find both the ABA Journal and Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram, or download the free apps from ABA Journal and Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by the ABA Journal or Legal Talk Network their respective officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, or subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.